we're changing up the pace a bit for today's episode of the Business of Biotech. Like many of my guests, today's visitor is an MD with a distinctive background. He was a research fellow at the National Cancer Institute a resident physician at both NYU Langone Medical Center and the Mount Sinai Health System, an assistant professor at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, and a faculty member at Montefiore Medical Center. But since 2011, today's guest has been practicing a very different profession, public relations. More specifically, he's been practicing PR for the life sciences companies. His name is Dr. Matt Middleman, and he's founding partner and CEO at an agency called LifeSci Communications. Dr. Middleman, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Matt. Oh, I'm honored to have you. And uh, today we're going to be talking directly to emerging biopharmas about a critical piece of the clinical stage business of biotech puzzle, and that's PR, your bailiwick. Um, so during this talk, I- I'm going to draw all sorts of advice and insight on the topic out of you, Dr. Middleman. Uh, While I'm not going to let you turn this show into an infomercial for for the agency, I do want to point out that LifeSciComs has been an incredible friend to this show since we launched it last year. Matt, your team has facilitated uh, several of our guests over the past year, and they've all, uh, guests and, and, uh, and, and reps over there included, been an absolute joy to work with. So Matt, just just so our audience has a true sense for for LifeSci Comms' place on on the landscape, I'm hoping you can give us a ballpark number, how many clients you're typically working with at any point in time, and nothing exact, but just just to give us a sense. Uh, We're working with around 60 companies now. Um, They range from private preclinical companies uh, all the way up through large pharma companies and everything in between, but a pretty diverse group. Yeah. Yeah. And and how many associates roughly do you have on staff? We have around 60 people. Already. Yeah. So around 60 people. And it's also, I'll, I'll also point out that at least from my perspective, I've worked for, I've worked with that as probably a dozen of them. And uh, f- from, from my perspective, the, the bulk of these associates, you know, they're not, uh, so I've been an, uh, an editor in the trade presses for well over 20 years. Uh, th- these associates of yours are not your typical kind of recent college grads with communications, you know, B- BAs and, 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 and comms. Uh, I, I think all, almost all of the, uh, the reps I've worked with are PhDs in, in a life sciences discipline, and that's unique. Obviously, it's by design. Yeah, yeah. We, we do have a bit of a unique platform. Um, you know, it, it was always my belief from the founding of the agency four and a half years ago that the more we can understand the science, the medicine, the data, the technology behind the products that the companies that we work with are trying to develop, then the better position will be, uh, better position will be in to help them communicate with their stakeholders and their target audiences. Because if you think about it, for emerging life sciences companies, particularly biotech companies, they're typically trying to engage with institutional investors, strategic partners, key opinion leaders, advocacy groups, trial investigators, and that group is not lay people by any stretch. Those are highly sophisticated audiences. Uh, So the better we can understand the science, we can better help our clients communicate with audiences of that level of sophistication. And look, it's not the whole team. So our our team's at about 60, uh, and we have about 20 MDs and PhDs as part of the services team. Uh, But the rest of the team is filled out with folks with very long, distinguished backgrounds in various areas of healthcare communications. And the real special sauce is the mix and the collaboration between these folks with different backgrounds. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that scientific background uh, that's so important to the, the culture there obviously starts at the top. And I want to I want to get into that by talking about you a little bit more. So as I mentioned, you've got your MD. You trained as a general surgeon uh, from somewhere around 94 through somewhere around 2011. You're, you're practicing. You're practicing transplant anesthesiology. You're teaching. You're, you're an academic. You're doing all these things that are sort of the hallmarks of a successful career in medicine. But then in the midst of all that, Back in somewhere around 05, I believe, there's this brief departure when you you joined Avalon Research as a senior equities analyst. So that's sort of the first blip on the radar that there might be something, you know, beyond practicing medicine in the future for Dr. Matt Middleman. Uh, tell us about that change and that experience uh, in, the, in the equity space. 
So I, I knew pretty early on in um, my training and education through medicine that I probably didn't want to practice clinical medicine. And uh, I, but I followed the path through residency, through practice, uh, and, you know, through training, I realized that you have to make a tremendous amount of sacrifices to be a good clinician, a good physician. And if you don't love the work, really love the work, then it's hard to make those sacrifices because they really are tremendous sacrifices that physicians make every day. Mm -hmm. Um, And and so I realized that I wasn't going to be happy in medicine uh, because I didn't want to have to make those sacrifices. I wanted to really love my career. uh, And if I did, then it makes those sacrifices worthwhile. And, And we all make sacrifices, obviously, to be successful in the various things we do. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, my, my first attempt at leaving medicine was on Wall Street um, to be an analyst, and that was a great experience. It wasn't right for me because it was really missing the creative element. And one of the things I was really looking for in a career was I love medicine. I love science, but I also love the business side of the industry, and I love creative. I like being a people person. And so... You know, being a research analyst, you got the science part, you got the business part, but it was there was that creative people interaction part of it that was really missing. Uh, and that's, you know, went back and, and practiced medicine for a little while longer and then discovered healthcare communications and PR. And it's really a rare space where you can get the deep science, you can get the deep medicine, you can be on the cutting edge of advances in the fields. Uh, at the same time, we do a lot in the business world, um, but we also get to be creative and inter- interact with people every day. And by the way, it's not just me. All these, uh, Most of the other academics that work with me uh, as part of our team were drawn by the same attributes, uh, those unique elements to this field. Yeah. Yeah. So you were, uh, the, the way I understand it, you were recruited uh, to, to start, to, 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 to sort of found LifeSci Communications back in 2017. Um, there was an existing investor relations group in place, I think, uh, at, at the founding uh, of LifeSci Comms. Um, so tell me a little bit about that Genesis story. What was that conversation like when, uh, you know, they said, hey, you know, Matt, what, what do you, what do you, what do you think about coming over here and launching this, uh, th- this thing we want to get, get going, um, and building that sort of from the ground up? It doesn't sound like uh, you were, a, a, you know, risk averse, uh, <laughs> you know, through, throughout your your career progression. But tell me about the risk involved in that, and, and kind of what where your mindset was when you when you were offered that opportunity. Well, I, I'm an entrepreneur at heart, and. Any entrepreneur recognizes the the risk that it takes to start a business uh, from the ground up uh, because you don't know whether it's going to succeed or not. But um, you know, LifeSite Advisors, which is our sister agency, is a well-known investor relations agency in the industry. It's one of the largest, not the largest, uh, around. And they were interested, uh, the, the two founders of LifeSite Advisors, Mike Rice and Andrew McDonald, were interested in being able to provide public relations and communication services to the large number of clients that they work with on the IR side. Um, And it's not an unheard of approach uh, because there are other investor relations agencies that have added communications or PR capabilities in-house, but they've made it more of an add-on within within those firms. And, And we decided to do it differently. And, and, and I started discussions with Mike Rice and Andrew um, very early in 2016. So we discussed how to do this for about a year before we decided to take the plunge and go ahead and do it. But, but what we decided to do differently was found a separate freestanding agency from the, life site, from, the, uh, from the investor relations firm. And that allowed us to really grow and blossom with our own set of capabilities and differentiators and team, uh, you know, looking back, it, it was really, I mean, it was, uh, we were having a tough time to decide which one of those uh, routes to take. And it was the best decision we ever made because we're here today uh, 
where we are now really because of that. Yeah, and that's a that's a it's a great great segue. And I want to I, I just want to linger here for a minute with a with a question about that and get your thoughts on it because investor relations in, in this space, really in any space, investor relations and public relations are are aligned, right? They're 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 sort of a marriage between the two. Yet they're distinct. As a matter of fact, when when we first started sort of kicking around the idea of having you on the show, uh, originally I'm thinking, well, I'd love to have a, a show where we discuss sort of IR 101 and PR 101. And uh, I think it was one of your teammates, Kristen Pleedy, who was like, you know what, let's treat those things separately because because they are separate yet yet connected. So that strategic decision that uh, that, that LifeSciComs made at the time to to you know, spin off a, a completely separate agency, as you said, was an important one. But to an emerging biotech, you know, to to the leaders of an emerging biotech who perhaps haven't been down this road before, who are considering their IR and PR strategies, uh, just briefly before we move on into into the PR uh, conversation, uh, describe for us, sort of crystallize the distinction between the two and why they need to be handled separately. Well, you know, I, I, I see both IR and PR uh, as really under one umbrella. It's uh, companies communicating with stakeholders. And the investor relations side, particular stakeholder is investors, obviously. And on the PR side, we're focused on investors, but also other audiences, the ones I mentioned, strategics and key opinion leaders and others. Uh, but the goal of both IR and PR is to raise awareness and visibility of the company among those audiences. And so the real difference between IR and PR is really how you go about doing that. Uh, IR is more of a direct interaction with investors. Investor relations firm will introduce and guide companies and its executives to meet investors face-to-face, one-on-one, through analyst calls and KOL events and whatnot. And on the public relations side, we use more of an indirect process where we utilize digital tools, the traditional media, social media, creative tools to interact with those audiences. So it's really, the objectives are generally the same, but it's a different set of tools that we utilize. Perfect. Okay. So let's let's drill down on PR. Let's start sort of at the, you know, as I said, the one-on-one level and give us the key points. Uh, again, speaking to emerging uh, leaders of emerging biopharmas, um, life sciences companies in general, what do they need to know about the importance of public relations for, for them? Um, you know, a lot, a lot of these companies kind of, it, it's, it, it, it's almost an afterthought at times, right? It's something that comes down the road and maybe gets kicked down the road a little further than it should. Uh, so what are the key points that they should be thinking about from the outset? Again, we go back to the objective of this work is to raise awareness of the company and or its products to a set of audiences. Uh, that's a critically important tool to increase value of the company. Because the more people know about what you're doing, the more folks in your audiences that are willing to engage uh, with you, your products and your work. So the the core objective of this work is to raise awareness of the company among a set of audiences. Uh, And one of the first things we ask the companies that we work with is what are the corporate objectives over the next 12, 18, 24 months? And if we can raise awareness of the company, how does that help you achieve your objectives? And based on those objectives and who the audiences are, who they're trying to interact with, usually investors and strategics and key opinion leaders and so on, uh, the answers to those questions end up determining the strategies and tactics. Uh, And emerging companies in particular have some deep challenges when it comes to communicating externally and achieving that awareness objective. And it starts with the fact that awareness level of most of these companies at baseline is typically low. Mm-hmm. It's simply very few people have heard of that company. Uh, and, but you layer that on top of the fact that most emerging biotech companies have limited news flow or infrequent news flow, two or three key press releases a year. So uh, you need to utilize every tool at your disposal, given those challenges, to try and achieve that awareness objective. Uh, and that's why our, our approach in particular, and it's, it's not all that unique, but, but the point is to overcome those challenges, you can't rely on 
one tool or another. It's how you use the digital tools, the social media, the traditional media, the creative tools. They all work together uh, is what's really important at uh, overcoming those particular challenges. Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, let, let's say I'm the leader of, a, of an emerging, or uh, let's, let's just call it a new biotech, right? I'm, I'm launching a new entity. Uh, I've got what I believe to be good science, which is key. I believe in my science. I believe in my small team. Uh, we're making some, you know, preclinical progress and perhaps it crosses my mind. Uh, we need to get the word out. We need to let people know what we're doing. Um, maybe one of the first thoughts I have is, well, we can kind of do that organically from within our own four walls. Can that be done? And, and, and why or why not? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, not, a, it's not really a can question. It's, it's how well are you going to be able to do it? Uh, I mean, we work with, again, companies in a wide range of sizes, stages, phases, uh, all the way up to the large pharma companies. And a small preclinical private company can benefit from raising awareness and works with an agency. Big pharma companies obviously work with many agencies at any given time. And so, and everything in between, uh, it's, uh, companies do at times bring PR, comms, IR folks in house and handle that internally. Uh, and. We work with companies that have internal folks, in-house people, and work with companies that don't. But at the end of the day, an agency is going to act like a force multiplier for whoever you have uh, kind of pointing those activities on your team, whether it's an expert or not. No one person is going to be expert in all of the tools that we need to do this work effectively. The Business of Biotech is brought to you in partnership with Cytiva. Together, we're committed to helping the leaders of new and emerging biopharma companies navigate the financial, organizational, human resources, and regulatory waters you'll encounter on your way from discovery to the clinic and beyond. Check out a host of useful resources for biotech leaders at Cytiva's Emerging Biotech Accelerator at citivalifesciences.com backslash emerging biotech. That's C-Y-T-I-V-A lifesciences.com backslash emerging biotech. Okay, so I want to get your opinion. And again, these, these, <laughs> this, this question certainly doesn't have a right or, or a wrong answer, but we can talk about some of the variables uh, that, that kind of align behind the question. But at, at what point, so you, you mentioned, you know, it's, it's, I don't want to say easy, but there's a, a relative cadence to newsworthiness, right? Like, hey, we've got something, we, we've done something, we've got some data that might be might, might be newsworthy. At what point do, does that kind of begin on the chronology of, you know, formation to clinic, uh, where it makes sense to invest either internally or, or, or externally in a communications strategy or agency? At what point is, is there a particular stage that's, um, ideal or too early or too late, I guess, uh, to, to really engage in the activity of, of public relations. I know that's a, I, this, is, this is my bad habit of using many words to ask a simple question, but I hope you get where I'm going. Yeah. And, and there's a macro answer to that question and a micro one. From a macro perspective, I get that question quite frequently from executives, from CEOs. Is it too early to do this? Is it the right time? And you know there is no stage or phase or size or public private that determines this is the right time to do this work. It's really the question of if we were able to raise awareness of the company, will that help you achieve your objectives? And if the answer is yes, then it's time to do this work. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, from from a macro perspective, that's really the question you want to ask first. Uh, from a micro perspective, if you're talking about communications or PR around the time of a major milestone, like data announcement or a big financing. We got a lot of companies that come to us a few weeks before a major announcement and, and we can handle that and that's great. <laughs> uh, but ideally, you're gonna want your communications firm to have at least six months to be able to do the groundwork, to socialize the story, to develop relationships with the folks that are really gonna help you communicate and broadcast that news ahead of that announcement. Yep. 
Okay. I want to, I want to uh, just throw a bit of a curveball at you and, and talk about those objectives. So you've mentioned on a couple of occasions that it's important to identify the objectives of the company. And then that's where, you know, an agency like LifeSite Comms comes in and develops a strategy, sort of backfills activities and strategies to accomplish that objective. So question number one on that topic is, do you find that most or none or somewhere in the middle <laughs> of, of your new clients can easily identify those objectives or is that something that they need help doing? Um, and then we'll, and then from there move on to like what, what some common objectives might, might be. Uh, I'm, good executive team should know what their corporate objectives are for the 12, 18, 24 months. And very typically it's raise money, recruit employees, bring a product through a regulatory process. And usually that includes recruiting for clinical trials. And that's generally the core objectives of an emerging biopharma or biotech company. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, when there is, as you mentioned, a milestone or a data announcement, uh, something to drum up interest around, create, you know, create news, uh, what are some best practices that, that uh, emerging biopharmas should sort of subscribe to ar around those milestones and data readouts? For any communications activity, we always go back to the core questions, which is who's our audience and what's our objective with those audiences? because the answers to those questions determine all the rest of the strategies and tactics. Now, once you've answered those questions, then uh, the, the typical process around a major milestone is first determining what your key messages are and how those messages, or how you want those messages to be resonating with the audiences that you wanna communicate with. And then laying out a strategic plan between time point zero and when you expect that milestone to happen, that includes activating all of the tools that I mentioned, the digital tools, traditional media, social media, creative. Uh, and if, you, if your plan employs all of those tools effectively, then at the end of the day, at the time of that milestone, then you're really in the best position to gain as much value as you can out of that, uh, out of that news trigger. And, and, and that's really the goal. And, and look, it's my belief that if you have a data milestone and you're a public company uh, and the data is positive, uh, your stock goes up a certain percentage, let's say 20% without doing any communications and awareness raising work, uh, that that increase in value would be greater if you did this communications work and you increase visibility and awareness ahead of that announcement. And what that delta actually is, is very hard to measure. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's the premise behind which our industry even exists. Yeah. Yeah. For, for those, uh, those of our listeners who might be considering, might be at that stage where they are considering uh, outsourcing or investing in uh, an agency relationship for public relations, uh, let's talk a little bit about what they should be looking for. And this is, again, Dr. Middleman, this is where I'm, 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 uh, pleading with you not to turn it into a, <laughs> an infomercial for life side comps. But what are sort of the, the elements of, uh, of a good recipe for that relationship between emerging biotech and, uh, and PR agency? And I'm going to try not to advertise, but <laughs> it's our approach of the more we understand your science, your business model, your technology, the more we can help you or your agency could help the company communicate with those sophisticated audiences. Uh, and, and understanding the science and the technology at a deep level forms a strategic relationship that uh, allows your agency to become extensions of the management team. And that allows the agency to bring value that goes beyond you know, just putting out press releases or calling on the media. So you know, if I were an executive for a biopharma company, I'd be looking for an agency that I could form a long lasting relationship with because most of these companies are on a multi-year journey and that's uh, you know, sometimes a decade or more. Yeah. And the more your agency become a strategic partner and have a long relationship, then the more value you're gonna get out of the work at the end of the day. 
Yeah. If I may, I'll offer up a piece of advice to folks who are considering a relationship with a PR agency. And that would be uh, get in touch with, you just mentioned developing relationships with editors. So I've been an editor for more than 20 years in, in trade presses. Get in touch with the editors in your trade space and ask their opinion. Because I can tell you, it's been some five years since I covered uh, technology in the retail sector. And there, is, or there are specific agencies, one in particular whose name I will not mention, who continues on a daily basis to spam me with pitches <laughs> from the retail tech sector, despite my very polite and repeated requests to be taken off of their list. And the acknowledgement on their part that, okay, we will, but they don't. <laughs> there are bad agencies. Get in touch with the, the folks who the agencies interact with and get some referrals. I mean, it's a, it's a no-brainer. Um, <laughs> see, it looks Speaking of require, yeah. Hey, I, I just, I, I'll step off my soapbox now. <laughs> um, so you, you alluded a, a few minutes ago to, you know, the, the delta that's difficult to, to measure around uh, the, the, the stock market uh, specifically. Um, return on investment for the money spent on on PR uh, campaigns and, re, and and agency relationships is also, I'm sure, at times dif- difficult to measure. But if we could take a stab at sort of quantifying that and 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 giving our audience some, um, I guess, pointers on what they should be looking for or at in terms of measurement of ROI, what would that be? How do they know it's working? Uh, what 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 you know? What what should they expect? And more importantly, to I think probably the leaders of these sponsor companies, what should their boards expect? Yeah, it's it's uh, the measurement question is a tricky one in our industry, which you pointed out. Uh, look, the gold standard again, we go back to the objective: raising awareness among a set of audiences. So the gold standard is to conduct an audit of your audience, time point zero, and you know time point X down the road, and you should see increase awareness and visibility. Uh, among those audiences. Now that audit process, uh, you know, most small biotech companies don't have the time or the resources uh, and the, the numbers and the audiences aren't large enough to make the data useful. Uh, so in, in lieu of that, there are surrogate markers for success of the work. From a media relations standpoint, we can measure not just how many stories or podcasts have been published, but who the audience or who the readers are for those publications and what's the breakdown of that readership or audience or percentage are investors what percentage are doctors or from industry Uh, and that data allows us to project are we reaching our audiences Uh, and then the other measure is well is our messages are our messages that we want to try and communicate to these audiences ending up in the stories Uh, and so a company goes out with a certain set of messages and speaks with a journalist, we want to see all of those messages replayed in the story. Um, Mm -hmm. That's a very important marker for success for us. Now, on the social media side, that's incredibly data rich. So it tends to be uh, easier to collect data and measure that data. Uh, Key performance data indicators or KPIs like engagement is something we can track and almost track it in real time because social media data is um, is so abundant. Yeah, I was surprised when I when I joined this space probably around eighteen months ago just how active a social scene there is in life sciences. I mean, it is a very you know LinkedIn and, and Twitter. It is a very vibrant, active, and involved uh, social scene. So that's got to be a key vehicle uh, for agencies like yours. Oh yeah, and and we. We kind of took a very strategic approach to social media. We have a whole division dedicated to social media. It's my belief it's as important, maybe not the most important uh, tool we have at our disposal. And what differentiates social media from, let's say, traditional media is the fact that we can reach our audiences directly. There's no podcasters or editors or journalists between us and our audience. Oh, now don't, 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 don't go there. Don't be cutting <laughs> out that middle man. Hey, this is, this is central to my livelihood. <laughs> um, and, and so we have complete control over the content and not only can we reach our audiences directly, but on the social media side, we can target our audiences, not just demographically, but even geo target, depending on where we want to reach those audiences. Uh, and so Social media, well, let me put it this way. 
you go back to the audiences that we're trying to reach, they're sophisticated corporate audiences. I think there's some belief that those audiences aren't necessarily engaged on social media, whether it's the institutional investors and strategics. And we know from data that's just not the case. The portfolio manager, him or herself, may not be tweeting, but I guarantee you they're monitoring and tracking in the back office. And so it's a very important tool that goes beyond just posting links to press releases and appearance at conferences uh, to reach our audiences. I and mean, we use tools that go as far as even paid social media work, which uh, if you know how to do it safely, is a, is a very uh, important tool to be using. Yeah, so that's a that's a a nice in depth look at a, a sort of a specialty area there at LifeSite Comms, um, and it's a good segue into my next question around you know what uh, areas of expertise or emerging service offerings are you are you looking at or perhaps preparing uh, for clients. This is a you know PR is an is an ever changing space. I mean, social turned it on its ear. Now social continues to evolve into platforms like Clubhouse. You know, there's always a surprise, right? Um, what other examples can you kind of point out that, that that give us an indication as to what you're keeping your your ear to the ground on and, and what, what uh, new offerings might be coming down the pike? Well, everyone loves visualization. And uh, even the social media platforms, you measure engagement on posts. Engagement goes up. I mean, sometimes in order of magnitude, if you have something visual connected to those posts, even just on tweets and Twitter. Uh, and so we we brought a whole creative design team in-house, not just for social media creative, but MOA animations and illustrations, uh, you name it. I think the, the, the focus on this type of visualization or creative tools is, is just getting uh, greater over time. I think you know, somewhat related to that is, and this goes back to the, the capabilities of social media, one of the things that uh, we've done is we've started a whole group that's dedicated towards clinical trial recruitment, mm. utilizing social media. You know, the real driver behind this is the fact that uh, the cost effectiveness of recruiting patients for clinical trials on social media can be orders of magnitude more cost effective than traditional methods. We're talking about tens of thousands of dollars per patient versus hundreds of dollars per patient. Uh, and so it's a real focus of ours, so much so that some of the CROs and the big pharma companies are actually coming to us for help on that front. It's, it's one of the fastest growing clinical trial recruitment spaces right now. Yeah, I can imagine it is. And I'm sure that, uh, you know, that that story is probably one of the, you know, if there is a silver lining to the pandemic, it's one of those uh, uh, stories that was probably accelerated by the pandemic, given the propensity for uh, for sponsors to run decentralized and, and remote clinical trials, uh, where there's not as much sort of face-to-face -face, um, advocacy or recruitment opportunity. So that I'm sure became a very important tool when people were sort of homebound. Yeah, well, the idea is to reach the decentralized clinical trials is the same. It's to reach patients where they are. Mm -hmm. uh, and the ability to do that not only increases your chances of increasing your recruitment numbers, but also gaining more diversity within your clinical trial population, which is uh, everybody's focus nowadays, including the FDAs. So. Uh, yeah, it's important, important techniques. Yeah, very cool. All right, so we're uh, running up against our stop time here, Dr. Middleman, but uh, give us a glimpse into the future. You, you just did to a degree, you know, kind of told, told us what, what's hot there, but uh, you're at 60-some associates right now, 60-some clients. Uh, where do you want to be in, in three, five years? Where do, you want, where do you want to take the company? What, is, what does Dr. Middleman want to see of his creation three to five years down the road? I mean, we've grown tremendously in four and a half years from one person, me, to, uh, to 60 where we are today. And, and we started life as LifeSite Public Relations. Uh, we're LifeSite Communications now, and that really reflects the fact that we're doing work that go beyond corporate PR for emerging biotech companies. And we're moving into the product comms or marketing spaces. And the idea is we have these long multi-year relationships with companies. And when they get to a position, usually late phase two, sometimes a little bit earlier where they're starting the pre-commercial activities, 
Because my view, it's silly to have to bring in some outside marketing agency that's never really going to understand the company's science or technology as well as we did. Uh, so we brought in folks that were pharma marketers by trade for many decades uh, and building that team to be able to support companies through commercialization, not just the early stages, but all the way up through launch. And, and so that's a present focus for us. And I think over the next three or four years, it's going to be an important part of our growth, uh, along with the clinical trial recruitment and some of the other tools that we have going. Awesome. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that you set some time aside to talk with us, Dr. Middleman. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure. I've enjoyed the conversation and I think you've offered up some pretty good actionable advice around the value of PR for, for new and emerging biopharmas that I think our audience is going to find valuable. Well, thank you for having me. It's been great. Yeah, my pleasure. We'll do it again. Maybe uh, we'll get one of your IR colleagues on the show next to talk, talk more specifically on that. But again, thank you for the time. You got it. That's Dr. Matt Middleman. I'm Matt Piller, and this is the Business of Biotech. We're produced in partnership with Cytiva, whose commitment to new and emerging biotech is on full display at cytivalifesciences.com backslash emerging biotech. Check that out. Check us out at bioprocessonline.com, where I encourage you to subscribe to my newsletter. And if you're learning something from this show, share it with your friends, share it with your colleagues, give us five stars. And as always, thanks for listening.